for your interest in refractors and refractor surgery. My name is Michael Seitz. I'm a cardiac surgeon at the University Hospital Geelong in Australia. 10% of patients presenting with trauma um, have one or more rib fractures. Rib fractures are associated with a large amount of morbidity as well as mortality. And traditionally, in the last 20 years or so, uh, rib fractures have been only treated conservatively. But what is evolving is that we actually can do better for patients. Now we have seven randomized control trials uh, with regards to rib, rib fixation. And today I want to go through the history of rib fractures and what we're up to in terms of evidence now. Addressing rib fractures is different to addressing other fractures. Rib fractures are unique in that the first thing is they can't be immobilized. Of course, as the patient breathes, sneezes or coughs, uh, a fracture uh, moves. And that uh, causes pain to the patient, and that has a follow-on effect, uh, causing pneumonia, atelectasis, and all those sort of uh, sequelae. The second thing is that the anatomy of the ribs is different from the top rib to the bottom rib, and different from the front to the back. The cortices of the ribs are very thin, uh, and which makes uh, fixation with uh, normal screws very difficult. Uh, ribs don't seem to be equally as important. Uh, the top two and the bottom two ribs, traditionally, we have said uh, in from a surgical point of view, these are not so important in terms of chest wall mechanics. Uh, we won't address them surgically. As it turns out, from this study listed here, these seem to be the very ribs that cause the most pain. So that's Im important when analyzing data where we compare surgical uh, rib fixation to conservative treatment when these ribs have not been addressed surgically. The injury pattern is different in older and younger patients. Younger patients uh, transmit the energy onto the lung, which presents with lung contusions, whereas older patients fracture their ribs and present with rib fractures. So the age group of patients uh, presenting with rib fractures is in fact the older um, age group. Each rib fracture uh, is associated with mortality, and each additional rib fracture increases that mortality exponentially. This is shown from the National Trauma Data Bank from the US. And what's important uh, to realize is that, of course, it's not just the rib fractures that add to this mortality, but rather the rib fracture is a reflection of the impact of the trauma. The same graph can be produced for morbidity as well, ICU length of stay, hospital length of stay, and that type of thing. And that really combines the last two slides in that if the age of the patient uh, and the number of fractures of your patient is high, the chance of that patient uh, not surviving the injury is extremely high in absolute terms. Uh, as you can see here on the x-axis, the number of ribs, and on the y-axis, the age, uh, it is five times higher uh, in those who are over the age of 65 and almost 65% mortality. These three risk factors can be teased out of the evidence in the literature again and again. If you have a patient with three or more rib fractures uh, who is more than 65 years of age and has a pre-existing medical condition, that is a patient who has a huge risk of mortality. And uh, consideration should be given to this patient of how he or she is managed and surgical fixation should really be considered in this patient. And I will show you why. Besides mortality, rib fractures is associated with a large amount of morbidity, and that's shown here. It's as this is data from 2014 and a young cohort of patients with flail segments. But what struck me as really important from this paper is that uh, patients were discharged to a long-term care facility, and um, not just a few patients, over a third of patients. This is not an isolated example in the literature, but rather uh, is demonstrated multiple times. In the US, uh, this is a paper that showed an average of 70 days employment loss, and 60% of patients didn't return to full-time employment or normal activity at four months follow-up. Another paper that followed up their patients up to six months showed that over half of their patients had what they described as a chronic disability, and almost a third were suffering from chronic pain. 
another retrospective study from Australia where patients were followed up up to two years and quality of life questionnaires were done. This showed that at all time points, patients with rib fractures had a much lower um, quality of life than in Australian norm, and only about 70% of patients returned to their normal work. The mortality and the morbidity from rib fractures really is indisputable. And what can we do about it? Well, this is one of the very early uh, studies uh, that demonstrates improvement in mortality and incidence of pneumonia. Retrospectively, they analyzed two cohorts, 1985 to 1989, 1989 to 1995. And what they changed from conservative therapy to pressure support, physiotherapy, pulmonary toileting, and all that sort of thing. And what they showed is an incredible result. They showed a mortality that's halved and an incidence of pneumonia that's halved. Regardless, it still remains extremely high. This is one of the earliest surgical interventions that's documented from 1995. And they compared pressure, positive pressure ventilation to KY fixation. And the results are incredible. The ventilation times decreased dramatically the ICU length of stay decreased, chest infection, septicemia, a requirement for a tracheostomy, and the mortality went from 29 to 8%. This is not a technology that's used anymore, but regardless, the outcomes are very encouraging. And to this date, there's seven randomized control trials um, with similar inclusion criteria and similar results overall. This is the first one from 2002, this is a patient cohort from Japan, and what they did is they uh, had patients in the ICU on a ventilator with flail segments, and they waited for five days to see how the patient went, and then said, okay, let's randomize these patients. And they randomized them to positive pressure ventilation and Judit struts. And again, pneumonia rates, ventilation times, ICU length of stay, requirement for tracheostomy really went down dramatically. They also did a questionnaire follow-up at one year and spirometry follow-up and a cost analysis. And all this was very much in favor in, of rib fixation. The next study is from 2005. What's interesting about this study is they excluded the top three ribs, but included costal control dislocation. They randomized their patients after 24 hours and operated within 72 hours. And what they uh, compared was conservative treatment, including strapping versus K wires and splints. And the results are shown here, as well as the two month follow up in spirometry. 2013 is a paper from Australia. Uh, again, patients in the ICU on a ventilator, no prospect of coming off the ventilator with flail segments. And what they used is absorbable pl plates versus non operative management. And again, the ICU length of stay went down. With that, there was a huge amount of cost saving per patient. The ventilation hours went down. The incidence of pneumonia went down. However, spirometry and quality of life follow-up at three months for this paper didn't show a difference. A study from Japan uh, looked at short-term and long-term. Long-term, they defined as eight weeks outcomes. And at eight weeks, they showed that chest wall pain, chest wall deformity, and dyspnea was still higher in the patients uh, who did not receive surgical intervention. The most recent randomized trial is from 2019, where patients with polytrauma and an injury severity score of 16 uh, was randomized to surgical intervention or conservative therapy. They excluded the top three and the bottom two ribs, and again showed ventilation times lower, ICU length of stay, and incidence of AIDS, pneumonia, and thoracic deformity much uh, improved. This is a meta-analysis from 2020 that summarizes all the available seven randomized control trials. And the first thing to show here is that the number of patients in each arm of the trials is pretty pretty low, uh, in one of them as low as 18 and 19. Um, so worthwhile pooling the data in, and seeing what it shows. And what it shows that clearly the hospital length of stay, the ICU length of stay, and the duration of mechanical ventilation is dramatically improved in patients with surgical rib fixation. The need for tracheostomy is much improved, and the incidence of pneumonia is much lower. Another important study 
published in 2020 a systematic review of uh, specifically addressing complications of refractor surgery. What I want to say here is that the data that is preceding probably 2015 um, is using technology that is probably not used so much anymore. K wires, absorbable plates, uh, splints, that sort of thing uh, is included in this uh, analysis. And overall, although the incidence of complications is low, um, as in 6.9% 6, 6 as listed here, I think if you excluded uh, the um, technology that is not used anymore, I think overall that number would be even lower now. In terms of guidelines, what to do, there's a number of uh, guidelines available to us. In 2010, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence a uh, statement uh, published showed that rib fixation consistently shows efficacy for flail chest wall injury and that the operation uh, really has no safety concerns. The Eastern Association of, for Surgery of Trauma, it's a Boston based group from 2016, uh, shows that in adults with flail uh, injury, they recommend surgical. Uh, intervention in order to decrease mortality, decrease ventilation times, ICU and hospital lengths of stay, and decrease the incidence of pneumonia, tracheostomy, and improve pain control. They also said in 2016 that patients with non-flail injury, we cannot give, an, uh, give a recommendation with the current available evidence. In 2017, we have a consensus statement uh, that is put together by experts from around the world and the way this works is that a statement gets put up and the experts from around the world say they, they agree or disagree with the statement and uh, overall the pertinent points from this is that uh, flail chest and multiple displaced fractures are very much uh, everyone is in agreement for surgical uh, fixation other uh, indications would be failed medical therapy and chronic uh, non-union. Other things the uh, experts uh, agree on is that they should be done early, a multidisciplinary team must be involved, a pulmonary toileting has to be um, instituted after the operation, um, they should have fixation if they're going to theatre for another reason, um, and stay away two and a half centimetres of the costal cartilage, and um, uh, fill the gap if the fracture site has a more than one centimeter gap. And the most recent uh, recommendation is that from the Chest Wall Injury Society that was published in January 2020, and they break these down into um, non ventilated patients and ventilated patients and give absolute and relative contraindications. And I want to put this together. Um, in my own words, uh, I think it's uh, nice to break down into acute and chronic fractures, anatomical indications, and clinical indications. I found the anatomical indications would be patients with a flail chest, those with uh, angulated fractures, and rib fractures that uh, require another indication to go to theater. Those should be fixed surgically. Clinical indications uh, are all those patients who fail early optimal non-operative management, um, meaning uncontrolled pain, ineffective cough, uh, etc. Now this is a tough one because of course you have to give a, a patient a chance to fail, but at the same time you want to operate as early as possible. Those who are intubated and are unable to come off a ventilator uh, also uh, due to pain also would uh, meet indication to go to theater. Chronic fractures are much more difficult to deal with. The anatomical indications for them is also a non-union after three to six months and persistent disabling pain. In terms of contraindications, uh, my practice has been probably a bit more aggressive than what the Chest Wall Injury Society says. Absolute contraindications for me would be a traumatic brain injury, an unstable C-spine or an empyema. Um, relative indicate, contraindications for me would be the proximity to the transverse process or the scapula and osteoporosis. This type of operation is really different in uh, different locations. I've seen this done in the US, in Germany, in the UK, in Australia. 
and everyone seems to be doing it differently. What I've come up with is I always um, have a double lumen endotracheal tube, and I do that for a number of reasons. The system I use, I often breach the pleura, but also I found I always wash out a hemothorax regardless of the radiological appearance, and um, that makes a difference. I think the inflammatory response that a patient has to fluid in the chest is quite high, and they seem to be, tolerate this quite well. Position the patient any way you need to get to the fracture. Most of the time that's in the lateral position, but they can be prone as well. The most important thing is to identify the fracture. In a thin patient, it's easy. In a large patient, it's very, very difficult. You can feel them sometimes. Sometimes you can identify them with ultrasound. And if you can't do that, you can put a camera on the inside and identify a fracture site from the inside uh, from a hematoma. As I said, I always put a camera in, wash out, and I always put an extra pleural catheter in at, at the same time. Any incision really is uh, okay, as long as you get to all the fractures. Um, often you can spare muscle, uh, and you can mobilize incredibly high. You can mobilize two or three interspaces uh, in, from a single incision. What I do is I f uh, free all the fractures first, uh, make sure the periosteum is kept intact, reduce the fracture, and plate. Uh, plate is according to the uh, acuity of the fracture. I found that the more chronic the fracture is, the longer plate I use to stay away from the fracture side itself. I always leave a chest drain afterwards and use the bat spot for that. And the most important thing is that in the post-operative period, really, it is a multidisciplinary input. You have to involve the acute pain service, um, the physiotherapists on the ward, um, the nursing staff on the ward, and of course education to the patient. And once the patient is discharged to the community, the GP has to be heavily involved in the patient's care as well. Just some examples from a recent patient that uh, I operated on. This is a patient who fell in the community, um, came to the hospital, was admitted to the ward, a couple of med calls for hypoxia, eventually was intubated uh, and uh, in ICU, was unable to be extubated. Um, as you can see here in the 3D recon, has um, three segmental uh, fractures uh, that are displaced, um, which makes him a flail. Intubated in ICU, really the perfect patient. Took him to the operating theater. Uh, I did three fractures for him as the fourth was not displaced washed out his chest, and he was able to be extubated the following day and was discharged uh, day 11 post-op. Uh, the reason for the delay was he had another medical issue unrelated to this. A young patient that fell over, uh, again, in the middle, you can see the 3D recon here. Um, initially, she was referred to us. Um, her analgesia was quite good. No pleural effusion, and um, we actually said she would not be for surgical management because she had such little pain. In fact, she presented on day 22 again, uh, now with a pleural effusion and uh, worsening pain. So based on this, we said we would uh, fix her ribs. And what I wanted to show here is she's a nice thin lady, and you can see the movement on the ultrasound here of a rib fracture. Incredible amounts of pain would be caused by this. And this is the post-operative result for her. You can see the pleural effusion has been washed out, and she's got four short plates uh, in place. This is another example that I want to show uh, as the patient uh, is a, um, a business owner and is a handyman. He fell off a ladder and had a scapular fracture and some displaced root fractures here. He has uh, the third fracture is under the scapula. Um, and incredible amounts of pain. And he really uh, spoke to me with regards to return of work. And based on the fact that he's a business owner and it's his own business, we agreed to take him to the operating theater. I uh, did not want to lift his scapula as he had a fracture there. So he had two, rib fix, uh, two fractures fixed. He um, was discharged on day two. I followed him up already. And um, he has no residual pain at all and is already uh, back working four weeks uh, after discharge. This is a patient uh, that presented 300 days after the initial injury uh, with a sensation of movement and difficult to control pain. You can see here in the 3D recons that 
Uh, she had fibrous nonunion and uh, gaps in her fracturocytes. Uh, based on the ongoing pain, uh, I also agreed to take her to the operating theater. And often what happens uh, when referrers think of a rib fracture surgery, they think of these type of incisions that are, of course, historical, very much looks like a patient was attacked by a shark. But in comparison to this, this is the example, one of the examples I've shown bef uh, before. This is a patient who got four uh, fractures, and you can see the incision really is about four to five centimeters, and you can mobilize the muscle that you can go up and down three interspaces. Um, it's a much lo smaller incision than previously. The technology is evolving. Some people even uh, offer a surgical intervention from within the chest that there's no incision on the outside at all. Thank you again for your interest in rib fracture surgery. <clears throat> I hope uh, this clears up some of the evidence. Overall, I think the message is involve a surgical team in a patient that uh, has over the age of 65, has a flail segment, has displaced fractures, has another reason to go to the theater, um, or is in ICU on a ventilator. Please, if there's any comments or questions, send me an email, michael.sites at barwonhealth.org.au. Thank you.